as a way of seeing that, that I mean, Ireland, also because Ireland's part of a single currency. So, um, the monetary policy of that currency has a profound <coughs> effect on our, on our lives as well. But, you know, but also, it, you know, it seems that this is a, a trend, a shift in the capitalism in the last 30, 40 years, a move back to kind of finance as the dominant role, and to try and kind of tease that out by using non-Irish examples. Um, so this here is, is, uh, is Liam Bourne, who was Chief Secretary to the kind of Treasury under the previous Labour administration in the UK. And when he, like, after the election, um, he left a note on his desk for, his, uh, for the incoming guy say, saying, uh, Dear Chief Secretary, I'm afraid to tell you there's no money left. <laughs> Yours sincerely, Liam Bourne. And he was kind of joking, you know, half joking about this. But it was kind of taken up because there's that idea that money runs out, that uh, the governments run out of money. And this is a new idea. This is a fairly new idea. And certainly any government that has its own currency, um, if, if it runs out of money, it's because it wants to. And this has to be kind of taken in on board as well. Not money now, but currency. So he said this, and I'm going to get in the way here just a few times. And then that was kind of picked up on by George Osborne. Um, who said, this one last year, the British government has run out of money because all the money was spent in the good years. Again, this idea that, that, that money kind of runs out, that there's a big pot of it, that governments are run the same as households. Although I, I don't know how many households have drunk a, a drunk kind of health system, but <laughs> maybe some do have drunk kind of, you know, in motorways and like, and the game of structure and ports to be a very big house, but how would never. Um, the British government has run out of money because all the money was spent in the good years. This is, a, this is an exceedingly patronising statement for any minister of, of, of finance to make to the general public, but such as, the, it, you know, in the narrative now, that um, it's kind of a... It's taken as being common sense. Uh, there's, there's a chair here. There's a chair as well. Do you want to just have some room, maybe? Uh, I've got my court suit over here. So maybe Space here as well, if you want. There's only a And again, this is my, this is it. Mervyn King. Um, Talking at the TUC at the TUC kind of conference, um, I, I think only only one trade union it walked out, and it was the Unite Union. It, it, it walked out when Mervyn King got showed up. Who's the who's the governor of the Bank of England? And he gave a speech at the TUC conference in the UK, saying, "We cannot just carry on as we are unless we reform our economy." And reform, of course, is a loaded word. Let me like, you know. It, uh, it, what that means. Rebalance kind of demand. I don't even know what that means. Restructure banking and restore the sustainability of our public finances. We shall not only uh, jeopardize recovery, but, but both fail the next uh, uh, generation. So we have a few things going on. This is in 2010. And two years later, uh, George Osborne, you know, he's saying. Um, all the money is gone. It, it was spent in the in the in the good years, right? This thing, he's saying that in in, in 2012. But Mervyn King himself, while governor of the of the Bank of England, um, the, for money that has run out, he's doing a he's doing a pretty good job making it. Um, <laughs> in 2009, they um, embarked on a period of a uh, quantitative easing of around 75 billion pounds, uh, followed by two years later by another. Uh, round of, of, of the quantitative easing. They got into corporate bond uh, purchases and they've more or less pumped into the financial sector in the UK and abroad around £375 billion. Uh, pounds. So for a, for a government that has, that has run out of money, this is a very strange statement then to make. To be, you know, um, isn't just him, of course, um, in terms of... Uh, Mario himself, good old Mario. Um, he says here, look, this is kind of quotes from, from him. In the European uh, context, tax rates are high and government expenditure is focused on current expenditure. A good 
consolidation. I don't know whether that's his in inverted commas or mine, I'm sorry. Um, is one where taxes are lower and the lower government expenditure is on infrastructure and other investments. So that's from, from 2012. In, in an Irish context, does that ring any bells for, you know, for anyone? Uh, that the way to have your economy is low tax and low government spending. Mm -hmm. well, Charlie, McCreevy. Charlie McCreevy. It is himself, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So how did that work out for us? <laughs> you know? This is in about 2012. He's putting forward this idea for him. The ideal fiscal consolidation, and here he's talking about a banking union or the you know um, or European Union, must be focused on spending cuts and not tax hikes. So it is essential that this consolidation effort is perceived as be credible, irreversible, and structural to have impact on sovereign debt spreads. So again, just kind of appease the markets. Uh, like few things, but Mario himself has been quite busy at the old printing press himself. Um, in December 2011, and, and three months later, or, or two months uh, you know, later, in Feb, uh, but collectively uh, through the the scheme, the long-term refinancing operations. That's just if you Google it, oh, just the handiest thing. You know, um, he printed essentially one trillion euros. Which I say to people is it's almost impossible to say one trillion euros and not be uh, like Dr. Evil in, <laughs> in you know in, um, in 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 Austin Powers one trillion euros, <laughs> which they gave to. There's a there's a crossover of the banks here, but you know you know overall around 800 banks three year loan at one percent. William, how are you? Sorry. curiosity, um, does anyone try to figure for how much the GCB is charging for the bailout uh, money? Like, like what's, the, what's the interest rate on that? Three, three, three and a quarter percent, or there. Yeah. Three point five percent. So, um, and the spreads uh, on the on the Spanish debt at the moment is around five percent, isn't it? It's around four and a half or or five percent on their bonds in the open market. This goes in this goes in open market. The ECB sells credit to the private banks at one percent. Who then sell it? Who then sell that onto nation states at, at like four or five percent, keeping the difference for just being in the cut. That's the system that it goes all the way around. The ECB is banned under the Maastricht uh, Treaty from selling credit directly to states in the in the Eurozone. So you have to go through this kind of round robin way of 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 passing credit on to kind of nation states in the in the Eurozone because they don't want to be seen to be um, you know to be funding a public operation. So the, the long point here then, I suppose, or, or the short point is, is that we have this narrative in the UK, in the ECB, and in Ireland here as well, because <coughs> Newton is always saying it as well, that we run out of money. Where is the money going to come from? Blah, blah, blah. Well, money has been made, and money has been printed. Well, credit, I'm sorry, I'm going to st stop saying money and just say credit. Credit has been made, and credit is being kind of produced, but it's for, the, the, it's for sale only through kind of private markets. So they'll make one trillion that then goes into into the private kind of banking system, and hopefully some of it will filter into their public sector. Now that's not what happened here. What happened to that one trillion dollars, the Doctor Evils, was um, I mean some banks in Spain and, and Italy used uh, used portions of those funds to buy higher higher yielding bonds issued by the government. At a time when most, invest, uh, most investors uh, uh, remained skittish and helped reduce government borrowing costs. But many banks primarily used the funds to pay down uh, uh, a maturing debt or simply deposited the money at other banks or with the ECB itself, even though they yield less. The infusion fell short of some politicians' hope that it would stimulate bank lending to customers in struggling 
European economies. What a lot of the banks did with the half a trillion that they got was that I think about 60% of that ended up on deposit with the ECB again. So they borrowed from the ECB, added 1%, and then put it on deposit on the overnight, a current account at 0.25% rate as well. So they're losing 0.75% uh -huh. on it. Damn straight. And then... Um, but they're using it to underpin the confidence in their other financial instruments that they're selling or, or, or they're trading at that time. Where it didn't go, it was into what I'm going to use as a shorthand, but the real economy. This is it. The, the reason being is that if it's put into the real economy, it might cause inflation. The reason why it might cause Inflation is not through the money itself, but through job, 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 job creation. More people working might have an inflationary <coughs> impact. So to avoid that inflation happening, job and stimulus is being kept down for this model then to work. They need the the spreads are so low that if you've got inflation of more than two or three percent, your profit seeking model under this starts to fall apart. That's, that, this is the underpinning of the austerity move in the, in, the, in, the, in the ECB at the moment. This is why there's 14.6% unemployed in, in Ireland, and that's the official figure. And around, I think it's 12% in the, in the EU zone then itself, in the, in the Eurozone. But how these guys make money is on the spreads at, at this time, and inflation eats into that. Yeah, just a quick, maybe quickly on. Um, yeah. So we heard post the crash, the, 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 the solution to the crash by Mario Draghi was to um, uh, cut taxes, lower investment, um, uh, like liberate kind of markets, all these kind of things. This is Jean Claude <coughs> Trichet speaking in Dublin on the on thirty first of of May, and he's saying implementing reform is a real challenge and this requires that we win the hearts and minds of the people. Countries are faced with the option of either either profoundly reforming their public, sec their, their, their public expenditure and social security systems or putting their long-term sustainability at risk. This is the either or Hobson's choice here. This is in 2004. And this is the and so what their solution was prior to the crash is their solution to dealing with the crash. Same thing. I mean, this is I mean there's a power. This is about power. This isn't about economics. This is about a model of making money that is being that is there is a strong linear narrative all the way through here. So it's basically. To cut spending, cut wages, use central bank credit to buy a paper assets and keep inflation at a at a low rate. Now, why this is happening is, um, in broad terms, this has been labelled the financialization of the of the e of the economy. There's an argument out there; it's one that I think is right. That uh, really what neoliberalism is, is not the re-emergence of a more vulgar and aggressive kind of capitalism, uh, because that's what capitalism is. <laughs> I mean, saying that it's, it's like, you know, I'm shocked, uh, shocked to find that it's vulgar, uh, you know, by capitalism in this realm, you know. But what's going on here is that the, it's a re-emergence of that tension in a capitalism, that intra-class kind of you know, tension in between those who produce and those who rent credit. This is, a, this is a clash that is constantly kind of going on. Um, finance was put in its box in the, in the post-war period when, when a product based uh, by capitalism and labor movement ganged up on it after the war and more or less put it in its box. Uh, by the 1960s, it's kind of re-emerging and by the late 1980s, it's, it's in the ascendancy all over again. How it makes money is different to how capitalism makes money. Um, the, the principle is still the same, it's not the product, it's the, it's the money that's flowing through it. But um, 
but whereas making something like this involves labor, the labor involved in, in making a, a like paper acid is quite weak. There's no kind of system involved, there's no chain as it would be in something like this, that, it, that involves paper, it involves writers, it involves printing. Um, a paper acid is basically like just made with just like one or two people at a, at a desk. You know? So the chain is what? Is where it kind of breaks down. Um, on, bum, bum, bum. And this is what we have here, this is the way of, like, of, of, of seeing it. That whereas we'd have this view of, kind of capitalism that's, it, it has, that it's, it's like production, and, and consumption, and then on this side is really these guys now. It's the rise of the, of the rentier. And again, it's a phrase we work on kind of Googling, a rentier by capitalism. It's used even by Paul Krugman now, which is why I've stopped using it. But um, <laughs> yeah. it's awful. I just, like, I, I, I started using it, and then I read, like, Paul Krugman. So I, 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 I can't use that. So now I use kind of comprador kind of capitalism, and hopefully he won't start using that one. But, um, <laughs> So even here, you know, you, you can see there's a whole chain here, there's a whole kind of supply chain, there's a whole system at play here. And this is quite weak in terms of how it makes stuff. Also, finance is wealth extraction, it's not wealth kind of production. And we'll deal with that kind of later on as well. I'm going to switch on because I want to get more questions. Um, <coughs> there's some a quote here from people who are working on checking out, they'd be uh, left liberals, but um, uh, I think their analysis is is a pretty strong, including Gerald Epstein, who's definitely work on checking out in terms of 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 the work on the financialization and the move towards that in like Western um, economies. Uh, but this quote here from Aswan um I'll put this up on the web so if people want the you know the the slides that be on Archive Review. Um, next to the hard copy, waiting by as well. Here. <laughs> um, what the wealthy, and this is important, uh, businesses and banks share is a common interest in supporting asset prices, a lack of interest in seeking full in, in employment unless it is a prerequisite for supporting asset prices and an aversion to any policies that can trigger wage inflation. And that's where we're watching now. Um, that that one trillion, <coughs> which like Mario Draghi um, of of credit that he produced um, over kind of three months, and the half a trillion which uh, Mervyn King has produced, we kind of know where it has kind of ended up. Um, if you want to check the the FTSE index of stocks and shares, is currently at its highest rate since before the crash. It's actually at 2007 yeah. levels in terms of the, of the index. Now, Western economies have been more or less dormant for four or five years. Where's the growth happening? Where's the confidence in all these things? Credit is seeking wealth to transform itself into money. It's the system that's done. And one way that, that credit transforms itself into money is through asset prices. It lodges itself into an asset the price appreciates and then it sells it off. We saw this most strongly in housing, but, it, 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 but the principle broadly like, plays out in anything that's an asset price, including stocks and shares, bonds, um, mortgage-backed securities. All the things that in Ireland are not taxed. So basically, a very easy way of, 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 of finding out what's an asset price and, and what isn't is look at Ireland's tax laws. If it's taxed, it probably isn't an, an asset price. If it is taxed, then it, then no. If, if, if it isn't taxed, then it probably is an asset price. If it isn't taxed, then it probably is. Ireland's capital, Ireland's capital gains tax is around four hundred million a year. You know, I mean, it's a it's a pittance given how much money is there as well. But this is what's kind of playing out. Um, yeah. Into the final stretch now. Uh, what's the jump in the in the Grand National? Uh, the, 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 Beaches Brook. We're at Beaches Brook now. We're almost there, lads. <laughs> we're almost there. Um, this is the uh, because like I'd rather just get like questions kind of going more than me just kind of uh, giving these kind of graphs. Um, I think this is probably a, 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 I'm fair in saying that this would be the 
normal narrative as to what banks do and how banks fund themselves. <coughs> Secondly, it's the one that's playing now with the promissory note and all that kind of stuff at the moment. The banks are intermediaries in between surplus savings and those who want to borrow. And they just act in, 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 in the middle, taking money from one pot and passing it on to someone else who, who needs them, that money. And this is the narrative that is played out all the time. That we have to, that if the go if, if George Coburn didn't bail out the banks, then, then all our grandparents would have lost all their savings and all the usual stuff forever. And, and the famine as well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they always just like throw in the dip. Um, so, so it's the view, so it's, 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 it's a deposit, okay, it's borrowers. The banks are just in the middle, they're just neutral in, in all of this, you know? Yeah. Well, this is actually how banks fund themselves. This is how it's done. This, this is more like what it's done. And this is what Ireland bailed out. This is why Ireland's bailout, um, Ireland accounts for 42% of the entire bank bailout in the in the EC in the in, in Eurozone area. 42% of the entire amount spent so far in bailing out banks is covered by one country and it's Ireland that has 1% of the GDP because Ireland guaranteed what is commonly known here as the parallel banking system or the shadow banking system mm -hmm. of which there's an introduction today in, in, in the Irish <laughs> But um, we won't go into all of these things, but the mortgage backed securities and the commercial mortgage backed securities work as specialities of Anglo Irish Bank and of Irish Nationwide as well. The two banks that are in the, the uh, which were in the IB or C until it was it was liquidated, um, if only. Um, so this is, these are the things that have changed. It also shows us that this is where investment has shifted into. Credit is used to invest in these products, hoping that there's a change in price and then you cash in. So how you change your money into, your credit into money, is by fluctuations in the price. And this is the model that has kind of come to the fore at the moment now, as we cover Beaches Brook. Um, just to break, you know, briefly that, um, this may be too simple for some, I'm sorry, but just kind of bear with me, you know, if it is. The nature of, of, of credit is something that I think we have to engage with. I don't think we can put it off for much longer. I mean, just kind of generally. Because it's now credit, and the nature of it has, in the last 24 hours, cost us 64 billion, 62 billion, mm -hmm. in less than, than like 24 hours. So what credit is, I think we should kind of have a sense of. Um, credit is it's an it's the expectation of future earnings realized today you pay you you get today what something could be worth in, in the future it's a form of time travel um, we're playing with time but we play with time all, all the all the time pardon the uh, you know you know the words there but I mean you know how we how, how we organize um, credit is a social technology it's a way of like it's a way of administrating complex human, human um, like structures, such as kind of human, uh, human societies. Now you have wealth and production in the future. Now again, this is a highly simplified model here. Obviously, it's not really a big circle. But, um, and that's in the future. And credit is the bridge that helps us build the future today in order to actually have this happen. How we explain is that it's a bit like architecture where we build the building in our heads in order then to build it. We see the building in our heads. And this is a human thing. And this is quite unique even on this planet. You know, that this is a very human thing where we we imagine something that doesn't exist in order to build it. And because it's so natural to us, we don't even think that it's special anymore. It's hugely, it's hugely special, you know? This is what we do here. We're, we're imagining what the future is in order to build that future. And credit kind of plays in that same area. I think that's why credit is seen in kind of mystical terms because it's drawn like in that same kind of um, imagination part of our, of our brain. Um, so, in, in today's world, then we have credit. And 
at its most basic, credit is a paper claim on future earnings. This is this would be kind of an it's a it's a it's a it's a quality of credit that's that's shared by all forms of a credit. It's a paper claim, first of all, it's only a piece of paper. And it's a claim on future earnings. So those who who trade in credit lend credit to those who want to build something in the future and when that builds there's a profit from it and some of that profit then goes back to the wealth or to the credit and lenders <coughs> themselves. Finance capital, it's wealth extraction, it's not production. It's fundamental. Finance does not make wealth, it cannot make wealth, it can only extract wealth and they have forgotten that. They think that there's, it, 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 it's a line, the like, subtitle uh, of Enron is the smartest guys in the room, and this is kind of what we're seeing here as well. It's wealth extraction. You need something to produce wealth in order to extract it. And that really hasn't happened. I've shown this eight, you know, eight on today, so some people might, it might be a bit of like deja vu. Um, what's happened with, with the change in the investment of 40 years, what's, it went to moving to kind of finance capital. We have paper claims on future earnings being used to invest in what are essentially other paper claims on future earnings. Um, if this sounds like something that can't last, it didn't. If it sounds like something that would blow up in everyone's face, it did. So you're not mad in thinking that this is mad, you know. Um, how long this lasts for, we kind of know now, it's about 30 years before it all kind of falls apart. Um, and again, because it's extracting them from this. Um, when this kind of blew up in, in 2008, um, what we got was this, roughly, again, I'm obviously kind of over, oversimplifying. But instead of these, these, kind of, these kind of paper claims falling, to, you know, to, uh, falling down into the ground, the nation state now is where the wealth and production is being kind of drawn from to realize these paper claims. And that's the tax revenue system itself. And that's what, and that's what we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it in Greece, in Portugal, in Spain, <coughs> in the UK. Not so much in, in, in the UK. There's other forces at, at play there as well. But definitely in Ireland as well. That what they've done is that in order to realize these paper claims, when their magic machine broke, they just transferred the wholesale onto the onto the nation state tax system itself, and that way of kind of making uh, well <coughs> itself as well. So, so when you hear the American Republican Party going on about the term, you know, wealth creators, it's a bit of an oxymoron. You know that they're saying that you know the big financiers that they're the ones that yeah. create jobs. It's 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 a uh, an oxymoron. It's 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 nonsense, and the only reason why. In fact, it is still like one reason why it's not in economics a anymore. It's, it's because it was in economics until Marx used it, so they couldn't use it anymore. So they came up with such bizarre ideas about the, the price and markets and like 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 like, like the, you know setting wealth because they couldn't use human labor anymore because Marx had appropriated that so well in his analysis. They came up with all these kind of other ideas, but the real wealth is made, of course, it's made by ordinary people, you know. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely, it's just nonsense, you know. Um, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, we're almost finished. Again, just, just using all the UK. Um, but this kind of GDP growth in the UK it drops down. Ireland, the same thing happens as well. I mean, Ireland's, Ireland's kind of GDP has, has been around 0 to 0.5%. 0 maybe kind of 1% in, in, in like one year, for about three or four years now. Um, Ireland's exports are, are at the highest level ever, and, and, and that's in terms of volume and value, higher than anything during the so-called Celtic Tiger years. Where's the kickback as far as our, um, 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 our society goes, you know? So I'll just finish then on, on Mervyn again. Good old Mervyn. Just, a, just going back to him. <coughs> they have money, or credit. They are producing credit. They're producing trillions of it. But it's going into propping up asset prices because that's where 
wealth has its its storage now. If we put it kind of this way, just to use it, it's that um, it's kind of um, it's jumping from wealth. Capital is is money in motion. It has to be in motion in order to to kind of keep itself alive. But as it jumps from a currency, this is a currency. It could be a euro or a or or, or, or a pound. So this is kind of moving. It's it's like it's like jumping up and down. They, it jumps into a massive price. While it's here in some kind of claim on the future earnings, if this changes value, when it jumps back backs into in the currency, they could lose out money. What they need is that being as stable as is possible so that they can have fun here. And that's kind of what we're seeing here now. And that's why they, uh, there is a bubble in asset prices in the, in the ECB. The ECB doesn't care. They said it isn't our problem. And that's why the FTSE can be so high. That's why even though oil demand is down, oil prices are up because there's fluctuation, there's, there's kind of speculation on the price of oil happening here as well. But the margins involved in this are so small that if you've got um, inflation of more than 3 or 4%, then your profit-seeking activities aren't going to happen. So, it's a, it's, so you need to keep inflation in the currency as low as possible in order to make your a, a, a asset price profit-seeking model work. You know? <coughs> and that's kind of what we're seeing now. And that's why um, there is such a push on for austerity because having full employment or having a move kind of towards that would put this model of making profit under severe strain and that's what we're, we're, we're watching now. How that's able to happen is because of power. This is, this is not about economics, this is about power. You know? And we saw that over the last uh, uh, like 24 hours where they were able to rush through um, an 80 page bill uh, pissed as well. Did, did anyone see those photographs? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, this is incredible. I mean, this really is. I mean, it, it's. I'm amazed at how I'm still amazed at, <laughs> at, at how this country can can shock me. I'm, I'm amazed that I am that it, it, I do get amazed at that. But I mean, so 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 really, just to 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 to, to kind of finish up on this, if you have your wealth in paper assets, you need austerity in order to ring fence your wealth. Um, and, that's what, and that's where we're watching now. In the past, um, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not a coincidence that uh, the US Steel funded um, the Roosevelt's campaign in 1932 because they, they, they were funding him to try and put manners on, on like finance, you know. But such is the such is the weakness of industrial kind of capitalism in advanced Western um, economies that that power punch isn't there anymore and finance is just one is 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 gonna run rampant. And I think that it, it that's what we're watching now. Um, I'm gonna stop there because I'd I'd rather get more questions and we see how we go on from there at all. I think we have probably have about 40, 45 minutes. We have a good stretch for it there. But um, so thanks for your time. Hope it wasn't too boring. And should we get into, into questions now? Anyway? Oh, sorry, and this, is, uh, this is ongoing uh, research. So if I say I don't know, I'm not lying. Okay, so, so, so please keep that in mind. But we open her up, you know. Yeah, what you say, um, this clash between uh, finance and, and, and manufacturing industry produ production. More or less, yes. Um, I mean, I think I'm right in saying that uh, at the moment, um, 70, 75 percent of the money is, is, is finance and 23 percent of regular bank loans go to the productive industries. The it's productive industries get much, much less of the, of the share of the, the yeah, bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, I'm just thinking back. I'd never seen this as a power struggle before you made, before you brought it up to me tonight. But looking back to the uh, to, to the eighties, when we had um, asset stripping, yeah, of a, of a, especially in Britain, of a large manufacturing industries that were perfectly able to continue yeah. turning over a small profit, maybe five percent yeah. a year, but they'd be bought up 
by some whiz kids from the city with finance, with leverage money, yeah. hedge fund and all this, and then stripped. Yeah. Um, and, and, and sold off to make a huge short-term turnover, yeah. and, and there was a company that could have continued making nuts and bolts for the next century, employing a thousand people and turning yeah. out a small profit. Yeah, and there's and, and there's two things. And that's logic of capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and there's two things killed in that in that process. One is is the industry, and the second is the trade union that was organised yeah. in that industry. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we really see kind of smashing here. Is yeah. that I mean, even in even in Ireland here now. There's the there's the, the contract system where people are they let go and then they're rehired as an, as an individual this individual contract stuff that we're all entrepreneurs. Oh God! <laughs> you know what I mean? So just to say one other thing and then I'll shut up. I just before I came here I was just talking to a, a young woman of my acquaintance. Well, not so young now. She's in her mid thirties. She's a well-known artist. She's talented, and she's teaching. She's teaching drawing at one of the colleges in, the, in this town. She has to reapply for her job every eight weeks. Yeah. Eight weeks. Yeah. 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 She's been doing this for seven years, and every eight weeks she has to reapply for her. Job. So she gets no sick pay. She gets no holiday pay. Mm -hmm. She's not covered. She takes a day off because her granny died. She loses a day's pay. Yeah. She's got no pension. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is all. I mean, like you know, um, it, 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 when you see a national economy at play, that was the <coughs> that was the move to smash anything that could cause wage inflation. And I think at the moment, this is what I think is going on in Ireland at at the moment. It, it, there's a paper done by Terence McDonough and another guy whose name I can't think of now, but it, it was posted there by Donna up on Irish Review. That talked about that this is Ireland's neoliberal revolution now is happening now, and this is why people are so kind of rabbits <coughs> caught in the headlight because um, Ireland's Ireland's welfare. Um, what neoliberalism always goes after, and this kind of finance one, is wherever a, wherever there is a compromise in between capital and labour, it has to destroy it. That's the that's the thing that it goes after every single time. In the US, it's the New Deal. In the UK and in Europe, it's the it's a welfare state, and in Ireland, it's Catholic social teaching and that compromise there. It's a weak right wing one, but it's still a compromise of sorts. So the Labour Court and the and the partnership, they can't have that. It is it is incompatible with their model that is at play now. So what we're seeing now is that attack on the weak right wing, but still a compromise in between capital and labour. That's being dismantled now. The last thing that the Irish kind of middle class <coughs> expected <coughs> was the state itself to turn on them, and it has, and they're not expecting it, and it's naked and raw. And that's where I, I think the, the kind of punch drunk, I, have a lot of, I, I use a lot of boxing analogies, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's very kind of violent, but that's where the, the, the kind of punch drunk feeling is going on now because this is not <laughs> Expected. Sorry, there was a question over there. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to add oh. to what you were saying there that, that one of the things about, say, Croke Park is that, you know, that if there were, if, shall we say, these neoliberal, uh, shall we say, eminence greases that you're talking about, mm. you know, that are, uh, shall we say, pulling strings behind the strings, etc., and putting words in, into Kenny's mouth, etc. Hang on, anyway, I get to the point. Is that the uh, you know the, if they met if they were actually meeting you know coordinated resistance particularly from the trade union movement then mm. this process would be a whole load more difficult. In fact, it would be nearly impossible. So you know, large. Well, no, I I would say no. It would be just more like an 80s Thatcher fight than yeah. the one I don't have it now. But they would still fight. Mm. You know but what I mean? The, because the, I mean, the, 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 like for them, this is a life or death struggle. And it's their life and their deaths. You know? Yeah, the only thing that will be different is that the, the result will be less certain. I don't know about that. I is mean, the, I mean have the you looked at, the, at the, the, the UK kind of recently? Provided, you know what I mean? provided it's the much more stronger, a, a much know, more stronger kind of trade union movement. And he got his ass kicked. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think we can just pick and choose what parts of an alternative you know, kind of universe if, you know, if, you know, if we can use here. They will fight. They, I mean, Look at what happened in the last 24 hours. And that's just one example of what they will do when their backs are up against the wall. They don't give a fuck. 
So I mean, I don't know if just having a stronger trade union movement would actually change things. What I do know is that given our partnership model, they are, they are desperately trying to hang on to that partnership model thinking that that's going to save them. But neoliberalism, this kind of finance won't, won't allow it and they don't see it. Well, that's not actually my point. Okay. Uh, <laughs> is, that, uh, that, is that there is use for, you could say, the, our neoliberal eminence greases for you know, a trade union movement that can be strung along with the promises that are in Croke Park in that you know, it obviates you know, what it, you know, any possible resistance coming from that direction and it makes, yeah. our, makes our task actually more certain. Except that it's breaking down and even the, even the guards now are, 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 you know, you know, have seen it for what it is. Yes, you know but, they're, I mean? but they're, starting, so, I mean, they're starting four years later than they could have been. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. as I said, it was it was rabbits caught in the or guards yeah. caught in the headlights. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it was. Like, uh, it was there, it's like a big kind of that. flash and light, of, like Commonface Jackson. It's not just a double thing, is it? Commonface <laughs> Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. Heard about it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that was the level of a like, Hades that even even Dante would go into. You know, just says, nah, it's, open the door, went, that's nah, okay. <laughs> um, but no, 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 it's true. It would be a different fight, but but they would need to. They have to kill that compromise. However weak that compromise is, they said, and like in and and partnership is a weak one, but they still have to kill it because they can't have wage inflation and keep this model going. Sorry, sir. Yeah. Well, <coughs> Uh, uh, last hour, uh, down in Charlotte, uh, where, when uh, uh, um, there was, uh, as you know, there was a panel with uh, Ganley and, and, and other people. It was indeed, yes. On, on it, you know? And I asked a question there, and the question was, wasn't it this, the, the situation that any crisis, whether it would be natural or economic or, or anything else, would be used to drive down income, uh, to cut services, and to push for privatisation of state assets. And uh, uh, Dermot um, uh, O'Flynn, O'Flynn yeah. actually asked Michael Taft <coughs> to, to answer. And Michael Taft said, yes. But then after a while, when he started talking for a while, he started qualifying what he said, uh, yes. And what he said was, yes, they, they would do that, but they don't do it consciously. They don't deliberately do it. They're just protecting their interests. Well, I believe that they do do it consciously. You know, and I think you can see exams are all in different parts of the world. Yeah. I, I'd like you to elaborate on that. No, I mean, um, damn, because um, A. Michael is a very good friend of mine. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's been taped, so God. Um, no, I mean, I mean, like, it's a mixture of both. If you look at, at the Small Firms Association in Ireland, if there's ever a group that spent five years cutting its own throat, it's them. Calling. Their entire business model is based on people having disposable mm -hmm. income in their pocket yeah, buying yeah, stuff yeah, in yeah. shops, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. This is where the post, like every so often, capital, like industrial capital, does gang up with labour to put finance back in its mm. box. But that, comp but but that allegiance isn't really there at the moment. But they spent three or four years going on to the TV and saying like, a, 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 we need to cut wages. And now they have cut wages and no one's buying anything in their shops and you have like shops kind of closing down because the one thing that, that, that isn't being dropped is, well in Dublin anyway, I, I, is, and, and you have upward only, upward yeah, only yeah, rents, yeah. that's yeah. a national thing isn't it? Yeah, it is yeah. yeah. so why, why are rents not being, uh, 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 not dropping? Well the largest, in Dublin anyway, the, uh, the largest single own, uh, by landowner or by landlords on like Grattan Street, is a hedge fund. Mm. So they don't give a damn. It's, it's asset stripping all over again. All they care about is the is the is the stream income stream that is coming on because they have monetized again that income stream through financialization. It's probably for another day, but they're able to turn streams of income into standalone products and then sell them on the open kind of money markets. Um, Mortgage-backed securities is a form of that. I'm sure people have 
have had dealings with that or whatever. But say when. Well, I'm dropping you. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I'll show up. Um, and like William is a is a is an editor of the Guardian Review as well. So so he can't interrupt me. It's it's impossible. <laughs> it's just my stake in his claim. So. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a complete exaggeration. Actually. But anyway, um, just what you're saying there actually uh, kind of brings me back to how I rationalise the the situation myself. You have the falling. Kind of overall falling rate of profit in manufacturing since the yeah. war, I think, and writing that, which is a kind of the classic Marxist uh, situation, the squeeze, you know. And then, uh, so you had to, like, products, manufactured products, were not turning in the profit, so significant profit. So they had to actually, the way I see it is, they had to invent another profit, another um, commodity, I should say. And that commodity is the financial instrument, you know. Um, do you think that holds up as a kind of a way of looking at it? No, I mean it's a it's a very strong analysis. It's um, it's put forward um, a lot by the Monthly Review, uh, a group in in, in, in like New York. Um, Hyman Minsky had a view of that as well, but but, uh, but he poured, he brought some melt into the equation. And Minsky was no socialist, but but he was still kind of finance, you know. And his thing was this intra-class kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. and, and, and 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 he's saying is that no, actually. It's more the uh, you know the uh, demonstrative review is that we have maybe a fallen rate of other profit. Now David Harvey, I'm sure people might know about here, mm -hmm. has no truck with this. He, he he doesn't think that there is at all, you yeah. know. Um, but so someone's wrong there, you know. But like probably Harvey. But um, <laughs> it, but Minsky had this thing is that in the 1960s this uh, this uh, this Gordon is is been let out of the box again. But this intra-class kind of conflict. That's happening. That is one of the main kind of drivers of, of of history, really. You know, um, is back on the rise then again. And but what's happened is that that whereas in the 1930s, in the 1920s, when finance was dominant and then crashes, uh, capital was able to gang up it with labour to try and put finance in its box. It took a world war, but it was able to kind of put it in its in its box. <coughs> <coughs> because of the fallen rate of profit, industry isn't that strong enough now. So we have a new situation. This is this is a, an analysis. I'm still in, I'm still con I'm still continuing the truth. But I mean, it does it, it, it has a lot of weight to it. That that's where that there's no one really in a, in the advanced uh, capitalist you know, you know countries of the of Northern Europe and you know um, and the and the US. To really land that sucker punch and battery boxing again um, on on finance, and that's kind of new. That's what's different from the 1930s. So you're talking about, in a way, the weaponization of credit uh, as part of the class war. That's a brilliant way of of, 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 of actually phrasing it. It is. It's the it's weaponization of the credit in the in the class war. That's a brilliant way of of of, of, of the credit. I mean, that's what we saw last night. Yeah. You know what I mean, I mean, this was a tried missile. You know. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about like I mean, I can't remember who it was. It's coming out with statements like austerity is not necessarily working mm. for the people and all the rest of it. And whereas the IMF in the past would have stopped their structural adjustment mm. programs regardless of the consequence of the people, mm. why are they now trying? Is it softening or is it actually that's not profitable for them? Why are they doing this? I think that they're just trying to make themselves like relevant by by coming up with a counter narrative. Mm. I think that's what's really at, at all. It's something I like. Maybe I'm kind of like stretching here, but it happens in academia <coughs> a lot, where you just go against the grain in order to have your voice heard. Like mm -hmm. the IMF is irrelevant, really. Um, so it's, it's trying to make itself quite relevant by going against <coughs> of, of the narrative, you know? Because I mean, it's against austerity in some countries, but it's not against it in Cyprus because that's Russian interests, so I mean screw them, you know. Um, and it's not against it in in, in you know in in the in the so called a global south, you know. So I mean I, I think that's what's probably kinda of going on. It's more of an of an intellectual kind of exercise trying to make itself, you know, but like relevant in a world where its narrative is now kind of mainstream. So it's really well actually I'm that's not really me at all, you know. <laughs> but I don't know because I mean because if it was really against austerity, it should be consistent with that, and I don't see that consistency, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean the uh, the World Bank is is coming out with some interesting stuff as well, you know, which is weird. They uh, the U.S. Fed, mm -hmm. no, sorry, the New York Fed, 
there's, there's something going on there. There's a lot of kind of Keynesians, you know, which today passes for kind of radicalism um, in, in the New York Fed. So there are kind of voices out there, and it's not just kind of counter narratives. There is a, a grown a grown kind of realization that this is nuts. But I don't think there's enough of a punch to really kind of put it back in its, in its box. And, and that would tie into in, in, in your point about, about organizing. That really, this does fall back onto, but there's no other way around this. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sorry, there's, there's nothing to answer. Sorry, I got there. Um, so, so what's the deal with the euro as a currency? Should we keep it or should we dis discard it? Since, uh, to my understanding, I think that it's like a purely uh, speculative medium. Uh, so, does it really do any good for European countries? It's the most insane currency that was ever invented. It's absolutely yeah. mad. It doesn't make any sense kind of whatsoever. The, uh, 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 the analogy that is used is, is usually the, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a Scandinavian single currency system, I think, in the 20s or, or, or the 50s. And they talk about the kind of staring area. The difference is that there was a core country with its own kind of tax system and its own kind of central bank and its own kind of nation state as the anchor for the other kind of currencies all around it. That is not the case in the in the eurozone. In the eurozone is it's um, it's a central bank with no country and countries with no central banks. You know, and um, I think it's a, a, a how they were able to to think that this would even work falls back on things like the euro currency that kind of develops in the in the 1950s and the 1960s and a lot of these bankers now this is now the third generation of bankers who who have gone through kind of European uh, banking system at that level where there is a a nationless currency it's, it, it's euro currency or, or, or sorry they uh, they they can euro dollar and they just think that this would work you know but it is a neoliberal currency as well, you know, because, it, because, because again, it's, it's acting, it's, it's treating credit as if it's actual money itself, and it's not. It's that thing about credit helps us to jump to the future, you know, and they, don't, and they do not seem to really kind of get that. It's a, it's a crazy, it's a, it's a crazy kind of currency. Also, in the Eurozone, there's no transference of surplus, you know. I mean, a Yanis Varoufakis, who's a, who's a Greek economist, who gets kind of slagged off on the left in, in, in Greece. I think he's, he's, a, he's a lot better than that. But he, but he gave a talk in the US there, like last year, a, a, a he said that, um, could you picture if North Dakota had a fiscal budget problem, and that was causing the entire collapse of the US state itself. How fragile could that be that something that is less than 1% of the, of the GDP of the US could bring down the entire kind of US system? But that's what we're being told about Ireland. If that's the case, it's not very, it's not very strong, is it? You know? So I mean, it's a, it's a crazy thing, but what's keeping it going now is not the currency itself, but the power structures that underpin it. And I don't see any kind of fracture in the eurozone really, so it could go on for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, there was there, there was other people there. But sorry. Um, so um, I'll, 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 I'll come back to you just after this. So from a working class perspective, what would be the adequate change of strategy? So what, what should the working class people do if they were trying to fight back? Would they focus on the banks? Then? <laughs> because from my point of view, I think nothing really changed because I, I see it probably from a kind of a Marxist perspective. The banks have been around all the time and uh, the change of the power shift between the banks and the industry doesn't really matter for the working class because I'm not sure it does if, if we were to, you know, as you said, put the, the finances back into the box. Well, the, I mean, the, the system uh, would still be wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, from, a, from a Marxist perspective, probably not. But I mean, um, from a working class perspective, we cannot ignore the war gains with social democracy. The social de uh, democracy has imploded. Yeah. But, but I mean, but I don't know. Is that, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know how you can use. How you can build that future of a Marxist world without painting it for people. 
am I asking this question or all of you? No, no, not at all. I'm just um, that, 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 like, you know, from a Marxist 